available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon. Happy New Year. Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have, with, we have with us the legendary British political pundit, Carl Benjamin, also known as Sargon of Akkad, the risen Sargon of Akkad. I wanted to have you on the first one of 2023 because after a long period of time, you have returned to Twitter. Now, when I just want to tell a story. I had to. I had to. I chose to visit Michael Allig in prison once. He was the club kid killer. And he had never been on the internet because he was in jail the whole time since the internet became a thing. And he's like, I don't understand. How can someone make money from a blog? What is a blog, right? And he wanted to have this whole documentary about, you know, joining the internet for the first time, like when you're in your 40s in the year 2000 or something. But you've been off Twitter for years and now you're back. Like, tell me what it's like leaving Plato's Cave. Is it, are you glad you're back? Are you like, why am I here? It, it, no, no, it's not leaving Plato's Cave, it's returning to Plato's <laughs> Cave. Uh, I, I was forcibly expelled and not allowed to look at the shadows on the walls. And I was forced to wander around the wasteland that is reality in the sunlight, touching the grass constantly, all day, every day. And it was just five years of hell. And then it was you and the quartering positioned Elon Musk and he was like... I will use my Jesus-like powers to Lazarus you back to life. And uh, and now I'm back in the cave with everyone else, banging my head on the wall because the shadows move wrong. And but uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know, back where I belong, you know, glad, glad to be here. To be honest. Has it, has it, has it, how much, has, <laughs> I feel like it's kind of like a high school reunion. It's like, oh, is everyone just like uglier and fatter and balder now? Like, how, how is it changing? Apart from me, <laughs> I'm the only person who's thinner. Like, I was way fatter when I got kicked out, and now I'm a lot thinner, so it's just like... <laughs> but, I... but everyone was really lovely, really, really lovely. It was, it was, it was genuinely heartwarming to come back, until the leftists were like, me, 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 like, okay, okay, shh. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, no, 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 I disagree. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you right there, and I'm not even joking. <laughs> uh, there must be an enormous part of you that thought, you thought I was dead and buried. You had been pissing on my grave. And now the hand reaches out from the earth and I lift myself up and I'm here and there's nothing you could do about it. And this isn't your house anymore. No, nah, no, I didn't. I didn't think anything like that. I was maybe a little bit. I mean, you know, it's, it, it, yes, there, there was definitely a part of me that thought that. But then there was another part of me that thought, you know what? Fresh start, clean okay. slate. I'm not just going to spend my day arguing and dunking on leftists. As, as fun as that is, I'm, I'm going to be mature and proper and decent about this. And so I, uh, I, I only post nice things. I don't insult anyone or anything like that. I'm, I'm very, very nice. But you are, you are right. It is nice to be able to come along and correct the record somewhat, you know. Um, but yeah, they, and you are right that they, they genuinely see it as if you're dead. You know, they're like, oh my God, how are you back? So well, what, they didn't have a funeral. I don't know. You know, what do you want from me? I wasn't actually gone. I just wasn't on Twitter, but then you're always on Twitter. But it's, it's kind of like uh, their reality is formed entirely by the, the visions on their screens. Mm. So in their perspective, it's like when you have a TV show and someone leaves the cast, right? That character effectively ceases to exist. Like on the, yeah. the reboot of yeah. Sex in the yeah. City, whatever her name is, uh, Miranda, whatever, the slutty one, yeah. Samantha. She just, oh, she's in Europe for some reason and they don't have cell phones or e email and she's never mentioned again. So it's yeah. the kind of thing we're like, all right, he's not on Twitter. He does not exist as an entity in our reality. And that's like, hold on a minute. Like, here I am. And it's just like, wait, wait, let, like they're looking through the pages. It's like, we wrote this fucker out of here. Like, how is I, I did get a lot of leftists going, oh my God, you're alive. Literally <laughs> saying you're alive. It's like, yes. And you're going to regret it. <laughs> Guess what's not a woman, bitch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what, what I wanted to talk to you particularly about is yeah. I am very uh, white pilled about America and its future. And I always say oh, that. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, we, we talk about it in a second. I want to talk to you about you. You run the few, and we're going to talk about Trump in a minute because you're one of the few outliers in that regard. But I always say that I'm very. I think other countries are, are shitholes, and there's no hope for them. 
And I wanted True. to specifically talk to you about British politics because something uh, you always Ameri- don't want to talk to me about British politics. British politics are fucking terrible. Okay, so that's awful. That's why it's funny. So um, what people in America don't What's understand is you guys had a new prime minister, Liz Truss, <coughs> the third female prime minister. Two of whom were, by every metric, complete calamities and and should never have been anywhere near number ten. Yeah, she, from my understanding, was one of the was as. That you described John Major, the best of a bad lot. Well, not the best, because there was that African <laughs> woman, I forget her name. Um uh, Kemi Badenoch, who yeah. would actually have been good, yeah. And she lasted like less than two months. And now they four brought, days. Yeah. And now they brought in this other guy who seems like the incarnation of a caricature of everything wrong with Toryism. It, did I get that right? Can you break this down? No, no, me? that's that's exactly right. Um, okay. I- imagine if the World Economic Forum was able to right. uh, get hold of a machine that could perfectly craft the the its its own avatar. Right, that's what Rishi Sunak is. He is exactly that product. And uh, it turned out that nobody in Britain wants Rishi Sunak to be the Prime Minister. Uh, He did put himself forward, but didn't win the leadership contest. Boris Johnson got ousted by his own party because of some pathetic scandal. And so the members got to vote on who the new Prime Minister was going to be. And by a two-to-one majority, they voted for Liz Truss, which is remarkable because Liz Truss is literally thick as pig shit. But she at least wasn't a WEF globalist. I mean, she wasn't any good. Uh, she, uh, but she, she thought, well, I'm going to bask in the glow of Margaret Thatcher because that's the only thing the Conservative Party have to hang on to at this point. And she was going to just implement Thatcher's agenda. But the thing is, Thatcher implemented Thatcher's agenda with a bit of understanding and a bit of nuance. Uh, she didn't just go in like a bull in a china shop, despite what the common historical record actually is, uh, or understanding of it actually is. Uh, she actually uh, was quite surgical in some regards. Uh, Liz Truss just doesn't have the brain power for that. Liz Truss probably pushing about 95 on a good day Holy uh, crap, for okay. her IQ. So, And she was surrounded by people who were quote-unquote intelligent, um, but for some reason that never showed. And so it it only took 44 days for the, the WEF faction inside the Conservative Party to oust her and literally install Rishi Sunak. And so now Wait, Rishi Sunak is the WEF. Before you puppet. get to that, though, I don't understand what she could have done. Help break it down for us. Because we have Kamala Harris and no one's oh, really talking oh, about oh, getting her out of office. Oh. How do you bungle it so badly <laughs> that, you, that at least the party... Because lo- at one point, mm-hmm. people don't appreciate mm-hmm. this. The Tories in the polls were somewhere around like 19 or 20 percent, which has never happened anything close to that in over 100 years. And if there had been an election call that day, you might have had one party labor rule. Yeah, on that day, if there'd been an election, the conservatives out of 650 odd seats would have had one. Yeah. One seat. It would have been the most historic wipeout. Um, Instead, they're a zombie party who are just going to get wiped out the next election. Um, so Liz Truss is high crime. I think you're going to particularly like this one. Is she came along and was like, right, everyone, you know what we're going to do? We're going to fix this country and we're going to do it by lowering taxes slightly. And the markets crashed. Everything went out of the window. The entire economy went into a swamp and drowned itself. And they were like, God, we've got to get rid of her. And that's the reason. Because I, I, I had read that and it seemed like I was missing something. <laughs> I know, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Because it, it wasn't, she's like, all right, we're going to abolish the NHS and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's going to be illegal for poor people to buy medicine. That's yeah, what the yeah, reaction yeah. seemed like. Yeah, and I'm no. like, wait a minute, she had like some kind of moderate, like tax and cut taxes no. and spending plan. And they're it's, like, oh, we got to dismember her immediately? What? It's, it was so tepid. It was so milk toast. It was like, maybe we need like a 5% tax cut on corporate tax or something to compete with Ireland, who are currently one of the most roaring economies in the EU. Maybe that would be a good idea. And yeah, I mean, literally the market bottomed out, the pound dropped, and everyone's like, oh God, we don't even know what that means. We don't know what it means when the pound drops, but it sounds bad. And therefore, oh God, we've got to get rid of the trust. Everyone, and everyone's just like, well, yeah, yeah I, we should, shouldn't we? Things are changing. It's like, but maybe some change would be a good thing because currently we're on a, a set of rails that are going over a cliff. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. Like, it's, it's, Liz Truss kind of fluked her way into saying something that was useful and sensible. But no, no, let's, let's keep getting, going on that track. We need to go off that cliff, guys. We've been on this track for 30 years now. I mean, if we get off this track, we might not go over that fucking cliff. Um, but yeah, it, if, if it, it's not like she came out and was like, listen, 
<laughs> I can't even think of something more ridiculous. No, it was really tepid, really milquetoast, and the the global order, were the the global elite order of the West, were like, no, we're not having any of this. Uh, we're going to destroy you. Uh, and so, thankfully, they've been demolished in the polls, and the Conservatives are going to get wiped out in the next election. And honestly, uh, good. Frankly, I kind of want the Labour Party to come in and fuck it up as well. Because, I mean, the Conservatives have done such a terrible job. At least the Labour Party are trying to do something, even if I think that the thing they're trying to do is wrong and evil. At least they're trying to do something, you know? Because at least I can say, well, look, here was your goal. Here's what you've destroyed. <laughs> and I can I can measure the distance between those things and smack them with it. The Conservatives literally just sit there, and they don't do anything. And they don't say they're going to do anything. And the, anything they've said they're going to do, everyone's like, yeah, but we knew you weren't going to do anything. And so you can't even really beat them with the stick of failing to live up to an agenda that they don't have. So it's just, what's the point? You know, I'd rather the people who at least are trying to do something to fail. Because, I mean, the Conservatives, they're no different to the Labour Party. Either, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to stop because I'll keep going on about it. Forever. Well, there's just one that I do want you to go on a rant on because I know my oh. answer, but I want to hear from someone who's more informed about the subject. <laughs> I, I, I saw a piece, and I don't even think it was The Guardian. I think it was some something like Yahoo News. I don't remember what it was. Right. That they described. I'm gonna, you know what? Let me Google it right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a very specific word, and and I saw it, and I'm like, you know, I don't think this is accurate. And let me see who it was. I can't. Oh, it's been it's been washed. I can't find it. There was some news outlet that referred to her policies as ultra libertarian. Would you? Bring <laughs> Oh, it was worse. It was described worse than that in the papers. Uh, they were called libertarian jihadis. <laughs> I mean, I was like, okay, well, that's better than I expected. But obviously, forty-four days later, done. Was she uh, advocating for massive spending cuts? Not massive. She wasn't advocating for any spending cuts. She was saying maybe we should just reduce taxes and increase the amount of debt we've got. Because I mean, let's be fair, we're never paying this debt back anyway, and who cares? And it's not like every other administration before us hasn't taken on massive amounts of debt anyway. So, I mean, maybe it was just the, the fact that she said it and you aren't okay. meant to say it. You just meant oh, to do it and, and accrue the debt. But uh, yeah, she, she wasn't advocating for massive spending cuts. She was just planning to take it as debt. And it's like, okay, while the economy got going due to spending cuts so we could get more corporate investment, blah, 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 more jobs, more growth. That sounds actually like a relatively benign plan to me, to be honest. I mean, it doesn't sound crazy. It's like Mitt Romney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm no expert, but that sounds like it might work. You yeah. Know? But but she uh, went in like a bull in a china shop and f spooked everyone. And that's the thing. People don't realize that all of the markets, everything that economic actually doesn't tie to production and consumption. It ties to how people feel about these things at any given time. This is how like Elon Musk can tweet, oh, the te Tesla stock's too high. And then Tesla stock crashed. It's like, that tweet didn't change the production of Teslas. Right. You know, it didn't change the amount of people who buy Teslas. What are you all freaking out about, you fucking idiots? But th this and this is what Liz trusted to essentially the British market. And it's like, okay, brilliant. So she had to go. So my other understanding before we get to Trump is uh, with with the departure of your beloved monarch Queen Elizabeth II and now King Charles, he. Look, Queen Elizabeth had been, pre uh, had been president, president, had been yeah. the monarch our entire lifetime. She was very much a British institution. She was widely respected as, as kind of, you know, not being as crazy as she could have been. A symbol of She was what good I, what, at what she did. Yeah, like as a, as a royal, it's like you're a symbol of continuity with the past. You're, you're this kind of figurehead. You call yourself, you don't take yourself completely seriously. She had a sense of humor about her sometimes, which I, I thought was really kind of, kind of fun. Mm. I remember I was watching, I think David Attenborough was interviewing her towards the end of her life, and he, she was showing him her, like, lands and they had a sundial that was in the shade of a tree and she's like why do we put the sundial in the shade it doesn't really work it was really cute yeah my question to you is my understanding is with king charles he is far less beloved he's certainly not an institution in britain like she has been for decades and that this bodes poorly for the ongoing continuation of the of the international commonwealth as well as wales be maintaining part of the uk is there any truth to that from your perspective I mean, possibly, but the thing is, Charles is an institution uh, because he's been Prince Charles for as long as I've been alive. Uh, so you probably like the last 50 or 60 years, something like that, he's been Prince Charles. Sure. Uh, I can't remember when he became Prince of Wales, but I'm pretty sure it was before I was born. Um, so it, he, he has been an institution, and he's always been a bit... Uh, 
soppy and left leaning, shall we say? Oh yeah. Uh, you know, and it, and it's always he's always obviously lived in the shade of his mother. But the thing is, he he had like an approval rating of around fifty percent. You know, half people oh. like he's okay. You know, um, but good. the institution of the king or the queen uh, is something that lives powerfully in the psyche of the English in particular, but I'm sure m much of the rest of Britain as well. And so when he became king, he handled it with such grace and dignity, and I thought he genuinely did, that uh, actually he, like before she, before Elizabeth died, uh, he was about 50%, and he shot up to about 75% approval rate. Wow, okay. Uh, and he's just kept his mouth shut ever since, which is really all we want out of the monarch, is to look kind of dignified in the royal regalia, and then just... I mean, to, to be honest with you, there's a growing sentiment in Britain that's like, yeah, maybe I actually would prefer the king to the parliament, because look at the parliament. Okay. Just look at all of those people. But Charles is hardly the sort of based king you'd want to come in and just be like, no, nah, actually, I own all this. Get out. Um, he's, he's not that guy, unfortunately. But uh, but maybe William will be. Who knows? Um but Charles is doing okay, actually, because he's just being dignified and he handled everything with great grace. And so everyone seems to be fairly well disposed to him. And I'm not hearing any uh, stirrings of secessionism oh. or anything like that outside of the normal claims yeah. of secessionism. There's nothing to do with Charles because he's really not, he's not Trump. You know, he, they can't be like, yeah, okay, that guy, look at that. He, yeah, that's, he's the reason we got it. He's not that at all. Uh, so, and maybe that's actually to the advantage of the United Kingdom as a united country. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't think any, outside of the usual Republican spheres, uh, nothing like that, really. Uh, there's a big concept in like pickup artist communities that when men are high status enough, that is the main attracted toward women. And that's going to be far more important in terms of getting a you know, hot girlfriend than it is in terms of getting in good shape necessarily or, or something else like that. Do you think King Charles disproves that given uh, what's on his arm? No, uh, I think that's a general uh, truism about male female interactions um, that uh, high status women go for high status men and the status is something that women are actually particularly attuned to. Uh, men men care more about looks, obviously, but that's what provides a woman with high status in a man's eyes. Um, Charles chose Camilla, and I don't know why, but they've been together for a long time, and they seem to like each other, so good for him. But the, this, for any pickup artist types watching, worry less about how pretty they are and how much they actually love you. You know, it's actually, yeah, that's fair. You know, it's it's it, we we tend to look at relationships totally wrong these days. You know, I was having an argument the other day with some some Zoomers about this. And they were like, yeah, well, that's easy for you to say because you're like, you know, famous and stuff. I'm like, mate, I was unemployed when I met my wife and, you know, she chased after me because she liked me and I was like, great, okay, let's go. And Wait. now we're married and she lucked out because I became successful. It was lucky for her. Not, I mean, I, I love this premise that like people in like Hollywood who are very successful don't have relationship problems. Like that is <laughs> the, the epicenter of people having nightmarish to the point where they're self-medicating and having unhealthy lifestyles. They're not living contented, fulfilling relationships. Who's more high status than Johnny Depp in Hollywood? Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, who wants his problems? You know? Right. I, 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 Johnny Depp came out of that looking really good to me. I, I thought he handled himself really well. She's obviously a manipulative bitch. But, like, who wants his problems, man? Yeah, and you know, and to to be fair, I'm sure Camilla never took a dump in Prince King's Prince or King Charles's bed. Not that we know of, no. <laughs> I think we I think we'd find out. Folks, you're welcome with Michael Malice is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Now, most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you could be doing right now, which is getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy. You could save money, do it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates, national average 12 month savings of $698 by new companies surveyed, by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states situations. 
let's get back to the show. This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisee. I love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit. This is why I created this podcast. We are very excited to welcome Jim Gaffigan, Yasmin Mohammed, Glenn Beck, Tim Dillon, Abigail Schreier, Jeff Garland, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Sam Harris, Heather Hying, Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So I had asked people on on Twitter if there's anyone out there in right of center punditry who uh, um, prefers Trump over DeSantis. And the name that people kept bringing out was you. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm very curious if that is your stance. And if so, what is the rationale behind it? Well, Trump's only got a few more years, really. And uh, DeSantis... He's a he's he's a safe bet in the bank, I think. Sure. Uh, I of you know obviously, DeSantis, everything Desantis has done has been fantastic, and he should keep doing it. In fact, he should do it more. And in fact, Desantis is definitely superior to Trump in many ways, because as I'm sure you remember clearly, Trump culturally is much more impactful than DeSantis, but legislatively, DeSantis is much more impactful than Trump. Trump very much governed as a moderate, and he thought he'd be able to bring the establishment essentially to heel and say, look, I've got the mandate of heaven from the American people. You need to start you know, understanding where your position in the hierarchy is. Uh, well, that didn't happen. Uh, and after one totally free and fair election, now Trump is relegated to the shadows, basically. But you see in the way they act, they're still obsessed with Trump. Yes. And that makes me think they can't let him go. Oh, not Trump, not Trump. And they don't they don't say anything particularly about DeSantis. They don't really care. They 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 kind of just whatever. It's all Trump, Trump, Trump. And it makes me think, right, because he looms so large in their imaginations, he's the guy we want to bring back, right? It's cause it's not like cause they might be like, oh right, okay. DeSantis is almost like a compromise candidate to them. they will be like, oh, oh right, okay. Saying. Yeah. Oh. Oh. You. We. We. We're having a conversation here, aren't we? Oh. Yeah. We didn't like Trump. Oh. And you didn't like Trump. Now. Great. Great. Okay. Well, let's have DeSantis. You yeah, know. Oh. DeSantis. Bad. We don't like what he's doing. No. 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 Who's the guy you really hate? Oh, it's Trump. Right. He's our guy. No. No. He's. Yeah. He, he, I know. He's seventy-eight. I don't care. He's the guy. Fuck you. That's my opinion. But my concern is, and I. I. I spent because he's been going after McConnell's wife, who had served Ali and Chow, who had served under him. I think if he got reelected he would be impeached and removed in weeks. And and I think McConnell Possibly. would get enough Republicans to vote for that removal. I'm not saying that's an argument not to get him elected or that makes him a bad candidate, but I'm saying mm. people who are for another Trump presidency have to keep in mind who his VP is because I don't think this is some kind of hypothetical. I think they had 50 votes already. Now if you've got McConnell to turn on him, which why wouldn't he? Um, McConnell does not care about Trump or MAGA. He went out he of his way to... It. He yeah, probably gets so, harassed by it every day. I can't right. Imagine he's so at all. he has an enormous incentive mm. to shake hands with uh, whoever, Hakeem Jeffries, whoever the Speaker of the House is, or uh, Kevin McCarthy, and be like, all right, we're getting him out of there. But what, what Trump should do is, I mean, I think Carrie Lake would be an amazing VP pick yes. for Trump. Um, she's got this incredible presence. She's a fantastic speaker. And she's the kind of person the average American looks up to. She's got that correct presence, you know, so they, they, you, you could have a a fantastic team here of Trump, the wrecking ball who doesn't care and everyone is familiar with, and then Carrie Lake to kind of clean up the mess afterwards uh, with a Hoover, you know, with a vacuum cleaner afterwards. Um, uh, She, she's fantastic. And he, I think that would be actually quite a fearsome team. So it could be that Mitch McConnell uh, is intent on committing political suicide, but I, I think it's worth doing. And Honestly, it's just because I want to see them driven even more mad than they already are. Well, you know, if that's the case, so here's the thing. You would want someone who they would think is even worse than Trump as the VP, which that's not a long list. So it would like a Marjorie Taylor Greene as she's VP. Too, she's too firebrand. Yeah, but they're not going to vote him. They're not going to move him from office. Yeah, but um, the, the Marjorie Taylor Greene, I think, would turn off too many normal Americans who could stomach Trump. Uh, but the media can go after her too easily. Ca- Carrie Lake would be an addition rather than a yeah, drag, I, see what you're I think. I see what you're saying, yeah. it's, And it's not that I don't like Marjorie Taylor Greene either, but I'm just being realistic, you know. So are you of the belief that Great Britain's best days are behind her? 
or do you think that in the medium term there's a possibility oh no we're, we're about to reconquer the empire mate you know we we, <laughs> we controlled a quarter of the world then we have the 20th century which didn't go great right but trust me the 21st century we're going to go for a third of the world this time you know oh yeah i think i think our best days are probably behind us at this point <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you you know <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this could, this, these could, like, it's just how, you know how Brexit laid the way for Trump? Like, this could be yeah. the big comebacks in 2024. <laughs> King Charles regains the empire, Trump in the White House, and everyone just throws their hands in there like, I don't know what the script is anymore. I mean, if, I mean, let's be fair, this, this century so far has been unexpected, so I'm not going to rule anything out, but I don't see that being the case. But if, I mean, don't get me wrong. If Charles were to do it, or perhaps William, okay, well, fair enough. You have my respect. You know what I mean. But uh, no, I, I, th I think, uh, I think Britain is waiting to break up. To be honest, the devolved Parliament is going to kill it eventually because there's too many secessionists who are actually got. Uh, they're getting paid to be secessionists. Uh, can you can you explain that to us? Because national divorce is a big issue here, which I've been very much in the forefront of pushing. Can you explain what that would look like <laughs> over there? Because well, it's actually closer to reality. Before we go on, uh, national divorce. Why are you pushing it? Uh, because I think America has had two inconcilable uh, cultures since the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. irreconcilable with irreconcilable differences, and I don't see any point in moving forward. And I think it's mm -hmm. I just want Texas to declare its independence. So as a Texan, you know, we could have a nice little country of our own. I thought you were from New York. Yeah, I moved to Austin a All year right, ago, okay. and I'm a Texan. Right, I have, uh, smart, good thinking. Um, Okay, so what does that do to America's power on the world stage? To stand in it's going to diminish it significantly, which right. I'm fine so with. So that is actually opening up uh, an opportunity for the reconquest of the empire, right? Are okay. <laughs> <laughs> we going to shake hands over the, over the screen? It's America that's holding us back at this point, you realize. So, uh, okay, right, I'm listening, I'm listening. I, I was a bit... I was a bit shaky on the national divorce because I was thinking, well, why would you cede half of America to a bunch of communists, wait, wait, right? Wait, wait, hold you know, on. You... I love this idea. What a, look at this Revolutionary <laughs> War twist ending. You fast forward, <laughs> and they're teaming up to get Britain to reconquer the world. <laughs> no one saw that coming. Uh, well, you know, who, who could have predicted? Um, but yeah, over, over here, so um, Britain isn't the United States. It's not a social contract society. Uh, it's a sentimental society. It's built on our loyalty to the king, actually. Uh, this began in the Union of the Crowns in the 17th century, the formal institution of the United Kingdom in the 18th century, the beginning of the 18th century. And the devolved parliaments came about in the early 2000s, I think it was, under the Labour government of Tony Blair, and what these are are kind of like um, the sort of state governments that you have okay. over in your country, um, but without the historical tradition of federalism. And so without an understanding of really what their point is, what their authority is, why they're doing what they're doing, because our local devolved parliaments, uh, it's only uh, I, I, the Northern Irish do have one actually, um, but Wales and Scotland in particular, what this has done is given careers to secessionists. So instead of being just angry, homeless people disheveled on the street, throwing stones at politicians, as they should be, uh, they actually get to wear suits and sit in an assembly and then sit there and go, ooh, Westminster bad, England bad, despite the fact that we're paying for all of this. Yeah. Um, and so this was a mistake that Tony Blair brought in because he wanted to create a kind of American-style federalized United Kingdom for some reason. Um, and this is tearing the union apart. And that's why we had the Scottish Inde independence referendum in 2014. And of course the Scottish national party won't shut up about it. They're like, it's only democracy is they're just like the Democrats. Right. It's only democracy when they win, you know, it was tyranny when they lost, uh, by quite a sizable margin. So it's just one of those things that won't, they won't give up. But the interesting thing about it is they're making the option of Scottish independence look less palatable. It was, it did go up to about 55% in the polling and now it's down to about 40%. Oh. So the, the SNP are actually by going on about it nonstop, people are just like, Oh, I'm sick of it. Kind of sick of it. Shut up. You know? Um, so actually maybe they're making it less likely. But, uh, but I think in the long run is eventually this will happen. You know, they've only been around for a decade or so, just over well, 15 years, something like that. So, you know, in 20 or 30 years, I think that we're going to see that it's essentially inevitable.
And they, I mean, they're not being sincere and they're being disingenuous, but the argument they're using, I think, is a legitimate one where they said, look, we voted for independence under uh, being Great Britain being part of the uh, European community. Now that Brexit has happened, we want to be part of the EU or have stronger ties to Europe. It's a different situation. Let's vote again. And I don't think that's an absurd argument to make. Wow, that's a good point, isn't it? That's the problem with these sort of consent-based democratic politics. Yeah. In a kingdom where actually you don't get to <laughs> vote your way out of it, you little shits. You know, <laughs> like, sorry, send in the dragoons. I don't know. Like, this isn't how this works. Uh, but, but jokes aside, that's exactly the problem with instituting Republican institutions like uh, referenda in what was otherwise a kind of evolutionary uh, democracy, should we say? Yeah. Um, it, it, it wasn't planned. There was no social contract. There was no rational organization. There was no lifting of another tradition and then rolling out the map flat and then being like, right, this is how we're going to do things. These things just kind of came together slowly over time. Uh, referendums, for example, is something we just didn't do until like the yeah. late 20th century. So it's, it's quite a strange thing. And it's not like we haven't had democratic institutions in this country for hundreds of years. It just wasn't the way that we did things. Um, and so this new innovation, again, it's, it's a Republican innovation being introduced into a monarchical system that is tearing the thing apart because exactly as you say, what difference is there in the logic? You know, the, if, if Britain as an entity should be free of the, the European union, which it should, well, why can't a Scottish nationalist or a Welsh nationalist say, well, why can't Scotland or Wales be free of the United Kingdom? Because yeah. they're both supranational states that rest on a collection of ostensibly willing uh, nation states. Good question. Uh, something I was bored the other day and I decided to take a look. So my favorite author is Inez, but she's a British that's, writer. Ma Michael, that's why I like you, right? Very few people begin any statement with, I was bored the other day, right? Honestly, it's so rare that a person even is able to get bored anymore. That's honestly, that's genuinely why I like these conversations. Do you, do you know, uh, the end of that sentence was, and I'll, I'll, this is all set up to it. I'll, I'll, yeah. here's, here's a spoiler. I was bored the other day, so I did a Google Street View walk of Grantham. But let me g give you the whole full story. <laughs> so on. my favorite British author is E. Nesbitt. She writes these children stories from the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. And they're very charming. And when I think of like charming and twee, that's a very British thing and, and this mm -hmm. kind of a, a sincere adorableness. And then I, Grantham is where Thatcher was from. And I did a little walking tour on my computer of her town. And I'm like, my God, what a shithole. It just seems so depressing. And there's like an H&M here and there's like a shitty little deli and just the, 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 con the brick, just everything about it just seemed awful. And I talked to my buddy, Chris Williamson, who I'm sure you know as well, you've spoken mm -hmm. with. And he goes, I'm wondering, because he's British as well. He goes, I'm wondering if what you are reading in these books isn't organic to Great Britain so much as a reaction to what you were perceiving and that these quaint little British towns are much quainter in the books than when you go there and there's just like Milwaukee or something. Is, is my impression accurate? Um, I don't know about Grantham, but actually uh, Britain and England are actually full of really quaint little towns. Oh, the okay. problem is, that, no, no, they genuinely are. The, the, the problem is modernity, frankly, uh, that you can get, oh, here's another high street uh, chain store that has the sort of modern looking yeah. front facing thing. Whereas before, if you go back 50 years or so, you would have had just local shops just run by okay. people who lived in the village. And they would have had like, you know, quirky, unique storefronts and, and signage that was entirely unique to that place because it was just one guy and his family yeah. running this shop, right? So it, it is it is not that when this book was written, things didn't represent what they did. And okay. remember, a lot of these buildings would have been uh, refurbished in the modern era as well. Uh, from the 70s onwards, guess who you can thank for this, Labour, uh, they, they decided what they wanted is modern architecture well modern architecture is like a psychic assault on the people who have to live with it uh and i don't know why it was popular i don't know why it persists because i just look at it and think well why don't we just tear that down and rebuild something in stone i mean a that's ugly as sin b it's probably not going to last a thousand years so why did you build it in the first place and c i i don't wanna have to live with it i don't have to look at it you know like so if you if you go around like almost almost anywhere in britain actually you can find like small country towns 
where they've, you know, like they've been frozen in time almost, uh, where the buildings themselves, the houses are hundreds of years old and built out of local materials, local stone, or like, you know, ancient red brick and stuff like this. And so they've got real charm and real character. And so they just, I've, I've not read those books, but I, I, can, I can guess the kind of descriptions they have in them. And 50, 60 years ago, those would have probably have been accurate. Uh, it's just that modernity is draining the life out of these places and centralizing it and corporatizing it and making it streamlined and homogenized and now we've got mcdonald's in every bloody city in the world you know and and there's also a sense when you're writing in the context where you're clearly the world's superpower and everything is charming and nice and you're always winning you, you could live in that little town and have this very kind of pollyanna view of the world and then come you know world war one and then the, you know with all those deaths for what reason and then the blitz uh when you know as thatcher constantly pointed out for a period of time it was britain versus hitler it was just one-on-one -on -one, and it wasn't looking so good for jolly old england uh that's gonna and then you're gonna have you know come in the labor governments and just economic despair for decades that's gonna take the wind out of a lot of people's sails yeah we were talking about this in the load seaters office today how is it that britain lost all of its confidence after being on the winning side in world yeah. war ii you know like it's it's just how did this happen you know and because uh, peter hitchens wrote a book called the abolition of britain and it's uh, have you have you ever read the abolition of britain no i haven't get the audiobook of it right and and i recommend the audiobook in particular because it's read by peter hitchens Are you familiar with peter hitchens i'm familiar with christopher is that his brother right it is his brother and he's hyper conservative, right? Okay. So he's got the same sort of voice, but imagine if he's not boldly proclaiming a stance, but instead he's deeply disappointed at his own civilization constantly. And so with the abolition of Britain, and I really mean it, you should definitely listen to the audiobook of it. Uh, he is explaining, and it was written in 1999, but it was very prescient and, and sounds very contemporary to now. He starts talking about what what went wrong for Britain and why it lost its self confidence. And I mean, basically, it begins with the black and white television and central heating and double glazing and all of these all of these things that don't actually sound like they have any connection to any of that. But actually, what you were watching with the introduction of modernity across this very ancient country was the breakup and atomization of the social bonds that yeah. kept everyone together. And so by the time of the, cause you go back and watch footage from like the turn of the 20th century, you notice everyone's dressed the same, you know, everyone's dressed the same. And then by like the eighties and nineties, everyone's wearing different colors. Everyone's looking, trying to look unique, but there's a homogeneity all of its own to this. And so now these people aren't really a product of a time and a place, or at least they flatter themselves that they're not. And this whole, this whole ancient civilization is just unraveling in front of his eyes. And this is the kind of thesis behind it. And so he, along with this, you've got the problem that the British intelligentsia always hated Britain. This is a point that Orwell makes repeatedly, that they would rather steal from the church poor box than sing the national anthem, you know, which is definitely true. It's definitely true. And, and they, they, they would find it far less shameful, right? And so when you're trapped in the country, that is losing its position as the global hegemon. I mean, it's easy to be, you know, when you've got the world's largest empire and all of human history, it's easy to say, well, look, you know, okay, we've got this anti-patriotic communist intelligentsia, fine, but look at the results we've got. You know, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. And even after this victory, we were doing okay. But the gradual decline during the 20th century, and it's like suddenly the snappy, the snippy little me, 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 me arguments of the communists, the, the poison working its way through the system begins to take effect. And actually, the affection and love for the previous order that was held up at great cost and great difficulty s unwinds, and it just f you find yourself just like sand and running through your fingers. You know, it's like, why can't I catch this? And so that's kind of, I think, how Britain lost World War II. Um, and it's it's genuinely sad, I think. You know, the, there's a great deal the, of of character that we have lost and really what we should be doing is actually returning to the sort of britain that the 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 institutions the cultural political the legal institutions that made us what we were before the left were able to 
get in under our skin and convince us actually maybe you're not so good maybe you're not so good maybe you should do the same thing that everyone else does maybe you're wrong about all of these things because it turns out we weren't wrong about any of those things and that's why we were such a great country you know so so no it's it's time to, to just repudiate all of these arguments from the left just say no you were wrong you were wrong you were wrong you were wrong and here's the proof look at what we're at you know was immigration a good idea was reducing standards for education a good idea was any of this a good idea you know is, is reducing the army a good idea is any anything that the left has been suggesting how about we give money away to poor people oh that didn't help them did it that made them dependent on the state how about we give money to refugees oh now we're swapped in refugees you know none of the things that the left wants to do work that's the fundamental answer whereas returning to strict high standards in schools corporal punishment a return of the death penalty for serious crimes things like this these were all like the the, the hard shell of like the british society that made people that actually know i've got to stand up straight i've got to be a bit more in line with the, what we're actually doing because we've got a project here almost right and we need to return to these things if we want to be a good country again but the thing is there's no appetite for it no one has the balls to turn around and be like you know what peter hitchens is actually right about all of this we all we've been laughing at peter hitchens for decades now because he's been like look these are the reasons everything's screwed and if we want to unscrew it we've got to go back to doing these things like we had to and no one's got the guts and it's a real real disappointment frankly while we're talking about things that we're looking forward to next year, one of the things that we should all be concerned about is hedging against inflation. Deutsche Bank, Citi, and Morgan Stanley, they're all forecasting another 25% plunge in the stock market, and the only break in inflation is with the recession. Over 80% of retirees are concerned about inflation and are very concerned about the stock market. And the author of Rich Dad, Per Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, said, I believe the economy is the biggest bubble in history. God have mercy on us all. And Kiyosaki, who bought more gold, is predicting $3,000 an ounce gold in a year. In 2008, the stock market and housing market crash. Meanwhile, gold went from 800 an ounce to 1600 over the next two and a half years. And that could be why Kiyosaki is forecasting $3,000 an ounce for gold. And billionaire economists agree on two things. One, we're heading toward a recession. And two, investors need to buy gold. So what you can do is call the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. You call 888-505-9845. Mention my name. That's Michael Malice. Or go to patriotgoldgroup.com slash p slash Michael dash malice and you'll get best in class service from patriots protecting patriots they have a no fee for life ira where your ira 401k can mean physical gold or silver you can be eligible for the no fee for life ira and qualifying rollovers call 888-505-9845 or go to patriotgoldgroup.com slash p slash michael dash malice for a free investor guide today patriot gold group is consumer affairs top rated gold ira dealer six years in a row all you got to do is call 888-505-9845 mention michael malice or Go to patriotgoldgroup.com slash p slash michael dash malice and you can protect your money let's get back to the show well speaking of things you know that, that liberals advocate for is it fair to say that now that great britain has its first non-caucasian prime minister that they were all excited and saying this the color barrier has been broken and what a great guy and we love rishi was, was there any at, at all uh, attempt at like keeping their face straight and and making those claims or was it just completely there was not even a pretense of celebration uh from the left that one of their goals was accomplished i don't recall seeing any wow which is really strange isn't it and it's because he was a conservative yeah. ostensibly in the conservative party should we say um what we did see was a lot of celebration from india itself which is very interesting because um if this is, if it, it, it very much speaks to the kind of falsehood of the multicultural project. It's like, okay, you know, like Rishi Sunak is obviously British, right? Obviously British, you know, born and raised in Britain, raised in Southampton, posh kid, goes to a posh school, marries the daughter of an Indian billionaire. Okay. Like no one in Britain, like they were, they wanted a racist backlash, but there just wasn't one. Because Rishi Sunak was a known quantity. We've got lots of Indians here. We've always had lots of Indians here, like at least in people's recent memory. Like the Indians aren't hostile to Britain generally either. And so it's, you know, nobody dislikes the Indians and there's no reason to care really the the thing i think is important is the fact there's a weft puppet yeah that seems to be the thing yeah. that's important to me but what do i know but it was interesting the indian reaction was oh finally an indian prime minister finally it's like right okay that is that is interesting that that's the thing you guys care so much about you know but what's interesting is he didn't get the mandate of heaven did he he didn't get voted yeah. in he didn't get the popular popular acclaim and he couldn't and it's not because he's indian either 
it's because he's an upper class toff. It's because he's out of touch. He and you can say, well, Boris was upper class, yeah, but Boris knew and liked the working man. He he had this finger on the pulse of what the regular Englishman, the regular Briton was thinking. Uh, Rishi Sunak does not have this, and will never have this, and will never have popular acclaim like Boris had. So he's going to signify, actually, a massive wipeout for the Conservative Party, which is hardly what you would want the first Asian Prime Minister, the effect that he's you'd want him to have. And the irony of it for the left is it's not because of racism. It's because he's a shill. It's, I mean, the difference between two of them is that I, I would guess that Boris likes a pint and Rishi likes yeah. his cocktails. And this man has never touched lager in his life. Yeah, that's exactly, that's the great way of describing it. That's exactly the right way to Rishi, Rishi doubtless drinks very expensive wine from God knows where that the average person has never even heard of and can't pronounce even if you were to present them a bottle of it. Um, let's talk a bit about someone who's almost certainly well, who knows politics is strange going to be the next pm which is sir Kier, right they're they're trying to position we have to keep talking about british politics well i mean you're an expert on it and, and americans <laughs> i mean expert. so much of God. so well you're, you're i just you're have to live in it yeah but i mean the point being so much yeah. of what happens in america is preceded by uh, uh um trends in the uk you had thatcher preceding reagan you had break mm -hmm. uh, brexit preceding trump's election uh there's the a lot currently kicking back against the woke in transgenders yeah, yeah uh, so... they're, they're doing a good job of that actually so let, let's we, it, conversely we get the same thing whenever whenever you guys invent some new stupid political term i just honestly it's, it's like clockwork six months time it's in our political discourse as well and it's just like ugh. Well, I, it's just actually funny because I don't know what percentage of the British population is black, but Black Lives Matter Three. was a huge, huge thing over there. It's like we don't have black people here. Like 3%. that's not our minority. Was it three? Three percent and mostly congregated in London. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the transgender stuff in one second. Can you, Sir here? they're positioning him as much more moderate than Jeremy Corbyn, which isn't saying yeah. much. Is he kind of a Tony <laughs> Blair kind of globalist yes. figure? Or Okay. Yeah. He's 100% Blair's creature. I believe he recently met Blair and was hanging out with him um, and being advised by him. Uh, but yeah, he's 100% he's going to follow the Blairite roots. The problem that Keir Starmer has, Sir Keir Starmer has, is he doesn't have Tony Blair's charisma. Okay. Uh, Tony Blair, for all his faults, was a fantastic communicator. Uh, he was excellent at putting his point across in a method that seemed like the normal, moderate, rational thing to do. Keir Starmer has the charisma of a brick, uh, and it's like literally bringing a house brick onto the stage and pointing all the cameras at it and giving it the microphone. No one wants to hear what it has to say. And so, and Keir Starmer's got an annoying voice as well. So when he starts talking in his little nasally voice, it's just like, oh, all right, Keir, you, you literally, you've just said hello and everyone's asleep. So no one, no one really wants to hear it. Everyone knows that he's just going to give you the Blairite line. So he will be the next prime minister, but he won't be a success. One of the things that I th you just touched on, and I'm glad you brought it up, is there's been a big pushback successfully in Great Britain about gender ideology. Uh, my understanding is a lot of these clinics have actually closed up shop uh, over in the UK. Um, well, we, we only had one, which was the Tavistock one. But the thing is, they've shut it down in order to open smaller subsidiaries of it, apparently. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll like, see what happens with that. But my understanding, and I think it's happening here in Minnesota, is this is in many ways a function of having um, a sizable Muslim population, that they were the ones who are in a position to and most ideologically invested in pushing back on these ideas is that inaccurate yeah that's inaccurate it's not it's not okay. the muslim population that's pushing back against tavistock uh they wouldn't they're smart enough not to let their kids go anywhere near any of this okay. uh, it, it was in birmingham that they uh just act, you know correctly protested against uh, the teaching of lgbt indoctrination in their schools and got it shut down in their local schools so it's it, it's not as far as i can tell infecting the muslim community because it's like it's unquranic we're not having it um which is fair uh no in in britain it there's a very very um influential movement called turfs trans exclusionary yeah. radical feminists now the, these people are in every other way insane leftists but the one <laughs> in every other way no no I, I, you're not that wasn't an right. exaggeration yeah. i'm familiar with, with them yes yeah but there is one thing that they can say that is true 
and it's categorically true, and that is that a woman is an adult human female. And it's like, right. And, and don't worry, I'm, I am actually friends with some of them. They're, you know, when you're not talking about politics, they're very nice people often, right? But they, they, they also have very strange views on men. Uh, but, and so they, 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 they frame the trans activism as a men's rights movement, which goes to show you everything you need to know. Cause it's like, right. Okay. Well, they you know, also that's... talk about it being like males colonizing female spaces. I mean, that's accurate though, to be fair. Yeah. That's, that's, that's true. That's like I said, that's the one thing they have. That's true. Uh, women are actually biologically determined. And so when you have, you know, the, the transition is going into these spaces. Well, it is a form of colonization through the sort of aesthetic of what a woman is because they dress like a woman. And so suddenly right now I'm, you know, entering at the top level, I'm going to work my way down into your spaces and into what, you know, drill down into what it is to be a woman. And this is why like, um, uh, artificial wombs are going to be the final frontier of transgenderism to finally, finally colonize the biological aspect, the essential aspect of womanhood, the ability to give birth. That's what they're going for. Um, but the, the turfs are, the, the turfs are winning victories over here. Uh, there's currently an issue going through, um, the Scottish parliament, which again, why these devolved parliaments are a bad idea, uh, where they just signed into law, I believe that, um, um, a person can just self-identify with no barriers whatsoever, right? And this was put through, and the UK government, Rishi Sunak, is actually like, well, maybe we'll take a look at this, because the Scottish Parliament is just full of insane left-wing radicals, and at least the Conservative Party isn't actively radical. Right. They, and they, they, they got this kind of slight understanding. Hand. There are a lot of women complaining about this. Maybe we should do something. So this is very, very tepid sort of, hmm. So the, there is a pushback here and it's, I do, I do credit the long history of empiricism in Britain, I think is the reason for it, because you can give us all the kind of abstract formulations you want with definitions, but that's a penis. Therefore, boy, you know, so it's, it, and it, there was literally one woman in the Scottish Parliament, who is screeching and pulled up her skirt to show her vagina in the Scottish Parliament, just with red in the face. Uh, and it's like, right, there we go. I mean, literally, we've got to the sort of Scottish FC position of, look, this is a vagina, I am a girl. It's like, okay. Was there blood shooting out of it? Not that I saw, but the picture was blurred. So, you know, I didn't really want to take a closer look, to be honest. Um, why do you think the turfs, because they're, I, I, People like J.K. Rowling is one of the people mm. who is just taking the lead, uh, and her she's point, probably funding which, a lot of it too. That's a great. She's yeah, she's got more money than the king. One of the things mm. she points out, she makes is like this is just, uh, um, uh, what's the term? Uh, train like when you try to tra tra pray the gay way, like um, that sort of thing. But she's this is the left wing version. Conversion therapy. Conversion therapy. She's like, if a little boy's a yeah. sissy and he wants to play with dolls and he likes the color pink. And he's limp wristed that doesn't make him a female it makes him a little sissy and you trying to put him on hormones and change his genitalia yeah. you guys are monsters whereas you know we had to fight for 30 years for these little boys to be acknowledged as okay he's yeah. just a little flamboyant whatever that's it's fine. okay for him to be a sissy it's, yes. it's okay or you, know, you, don't, you don't popular. have to it's, it's the same with the girls who are tomboys as well right it's like it's it's okay if she doesn't want to play with the dolls it doesn't make her a man you freaks <laughs> you know it's okay you know yeah I'm, she wants I've to always, play softball and yeah, let out go it's go nuts. fine you know no one cares you know i've always been a bit of a tomboy respecter to be honest you so know, it's, why it's, do you think it's so much more effective there the pushback from feminist than it is here uh bec because the, generally the people in charge are sympathetic that's why um, okay and i i and i put that because of the generally empiricist nature of britain uh we're very you know we're not very smart frankly you know we don't spend a lot of time reading theory unlike the french and the germans and so when this ideology ends up and you know a, colonizing america and it's it's filtering through american academia You've got very intelligent people who write very long treatises that end up being refuted by a Scottish lady raising her skirt in the parliament. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. okay, well, you know, and everyone's just like, well, I mean, <laughs> Wait, she, does, she, she does have a vagina. That makes her a woman. He's got a penis. Wait, that makes him a, who, a man. Who was it? Who just kicked a rock and said, I refute it thus? I, I don't know, actually, but like, that's exactly, exactly what's just happened in the Scottish parliament. Look at my vagina. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Okay. Okay. You know, so that that's, that's, that's what happened. But in America, 
it, there is there is the sort of rumblings of a turf movement in America, but at the moment you're very ideological. And I, I, maybe it's because America itself is an ideological construct, right? You are a propositional right. nation. You're based on a particular idea, and so maybe that inclines you towards being ideological, whether you realize it or not. Whereas, like I said, we're not. We're a sentimental nation. So it's just like, okay, well, just how do you feel? What's in front of you? So, well, I feel that's a bloke in a dress, actually. You know. <laughs> You can come up with all the clever words that you want, but still going to have a penis, still wearing a dress. So I, th I think that's the reason, fundamentally. Uh, is it fair to say, let's, let's move on to uh, something that you might have even more despair for, but maybe not. Is it fair to say that no matter how bad the future is in terms of politics in Great Britain, Europe is even more screwed? Well, yeah, and especially in the direct immediate like good luck Germans. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of specifically. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, when has there ever been a time when it wasn't the case? Like, well, good luck Germans, you know, it's, it's all as it's always thus been. Um, what would someone think of the poor Germans? <laughs> I guess, I guess you're endorsing Kanye for prime minister. <laughs> I'm definitely endorsing him for chancellor. <laughs> I tell you, the Kanye stuff's so funny, wasn't it? Like, I just couldn't stop laughing. There's something about his delivery. His comic timing is so good. Like, well, the, the the clip of him being like, uh, my doctor said I was you know, bipolar or whatever. I'm not going to say the ethnicity. I'm not going to say his race. He was Jewish. And it's like, fucking Kanye, what are you, Michael Scott? You know, like, this is pure the office levels of comedy. You know, when he's like, you know, uh, everyone did good things. Especially Hitler. It's like, oh, well, I think it's what he's like. Hitler invented the microphone at highways. Yeah, what? And, and Alex Jones had to be like, no, that, that's not what happened. <laughs> yeah, I love that Kanye's made the Alex Jones the reasonable person in the room, right? Because yeah. I mean, like, you can accuse Alex Jones of a lot of things, but being pro Hitler is not one of them, you know? <laughs> so Alex Jones is like, what the fuck are we doing? I had him on, I had him on the show a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, I, yeah. I'm like, look, I'm Jewish, Alex, but explain to me why, from your perspective, you're against Hitler. And he's like, oh, I didn't really think I'd be having to, have to do this now, but here we go. <laughs> It's not a hard case to make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, Alex Jones thinks a lot of crazy things, I'm sure, but like, he's never, as far as I can tell, been even vaguely sympathetic to the Nazis. No, Why no. would he? He's an American. You know, I'm English. Why would I be sympathetic to the Nazis? What's, Kanye West. What's, <laughs> it's, so anyway, British, uh, European politics. Yeah. It, so, take. honestly, I don't know. Okay. Um, with, uh, like the, the the Germans have a habit of assuming the correctness of their position, even when the world is falling apart around them. Uh, for example, the, and the, it, especially when France is actually providing a much stronger example of what we should have done by building loads of nuclear power stations. Uh, the Germans have returned to coal, like good old traditional dwarves or something. Uh, they're, they're mining the coal out of mountains and burning it because environmentalism. And it's like, yeah, but France isn't, and you decommissioned all your nuclear power plants because for some reason nuclear energy was bad, and no one ever really made the case, you just did it and made yourselves reliant on Russia. Not a good idea. Didn't work out well. For some reason, you thought that the Russians would never act like Russians, which is a strange <laughs> bet. But I mean, it's just it's just such a weird thing. It's like Vladimir Putin, yeah, he's a trustworthy guy. Let's sign that contract. Like, what are you doing? <coughs> so, <clears throat> but as it's ever been in Europe, um, they make bad decisions and then act like they're better than everyone. So, I don't know. I, I, I dread to make any predictions. I can't see it going well, but like I said, I'm no expert really. So I just, what? Here's I can't see the European Union doing very well, frankly. What issue do you think is people aren't talking enough about and that you can foresee exploding into larger popular consciousness as 2023 rolls around? It's got to be immigration. Oh, yeah. It's got to be immigration because it like... In America, you guys think you're insulated from it, but you're not. Oh, not you at know, all. You, 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 like you, your legal immigration is, what, a million and a half a year, two million a year, something like is that. Is it that high? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it was, wow. it was, it was a million a year under Trump, but it's probably gone up. I'd have to check. But it's, it's you guys don't have a country. You don't have a border. You just have a place that you live, and people come and go as they like. And this, I think, is doing damage to the social fabric of your country, has done lots of damage to the social fabric of my country. In France at the moment, 
it seems that there was a shooting in the in a Kurdish district in Paris. And I was like, oh, God, that sounds terrible. It's far-right ultra-nationalists. It's like, well, if that's what you want to call the Turks, yeah. yeah. Because it looks... <laughs> Uh, which I would call them far right ultra nationalists, actually. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah, which is fair. But the 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 label far right ultra nationalist it seems to imply some sort of white French man, right? Right. No, it, 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 I I only saw a report earlier, so maybe this is subject to change. But it seemed that it was the the Kurds themselves thought it was some Turkish attack on them by some Turkish ultra nationalists. Like I said, I'm not sure. So fact check me on that. You know, breaking news, blah blah blah. Um, but the point is, the diversity isn't playing nicely together. Uh, in Leicester, which is now one third English, uh, we have massive Hindu and Muslim communities. Well, guess who the best of friends are and always have been? That's right, Hindus and Muslims. And so there was a football match. No, it was a cricket match, I think, actually. And so they had massive riots. And they were literally for like four days straight. Wait, wait, hold on. Each other. I interrupt you. People riot over cricket? Not normally. But I mean, cricket? That's Not like the civilized most... people. Don't but... the games go on for like three days? No, no, the game doesn't go on three days. The riot goes on three ah, days, ah, right? Because, but what? And it's not really about the cricket. It's about the right. fact that Muslims and Hindus hate each other. Because when the Muslims arrived in India, they massacred like four hundred million Indians, and they've been doing it ever since. And so the Hindus are just like, well, we kind of hate you guys, and that's why they had the partition where the Muslims went to Pakistan and the Hindus stayed in India, and a million people died in the in the process, and that's somehow Britain's fault. Um, and so it. it it's obvious that these kind of ethnic tensions have been brought here, but it's yeah. even worse than that though, because, and I see this even in my own town, which is not a prestigious or important place. The worst parts about all of this really, if, if it was a consistent ethnic group that came like with you guys, Mexicans, you can learn Spanish. You can learn Mexican customs. You can start to enjoy Mexican food because you can habituate yourself to it. But that's actually not the problem that we have. The problem that we have is our immigrants are coming from fucking everywhere. Right. For example, in the, in the local t high street, I was walking through the town the other day and I was walking along and you, I can hear some kind of Eastern European being spoken. Don't know who they are. Don't know where they come from. Don't know what they're saying. Don't know how I could go, you know, like learn their language. Then you walk past, you know, several different like groups of people who I'm guessing are Middle Eastern. Who knows? You know, they're speaking in some gibberish language can't identify where they're coming from. And then you walk past like sub-Saharan Africans, but again, they're not from one country. And so they've got different sounding accents as they're walking past. And then I walked past a bunch of Arabic looking guys, all French, or at least French speaking. So from North Africa. And then I walked past another group of different Arabic looking guys, but they're speaking French as well. And I'm like, just if you're from Morocco or wherever the Maghreb somewhere, and you end up in Swindon, unable to speak English or apparently unable to, how is that you didn't arrive at the French equivalent of Swindon? Yeah. You know, why aren't you in some backwater French town where you can at least speak the language? I just can't understand how this has happened, but you, you see the point is we've turned into like a sort of Baghdad bazaar where it's just people from all over the world who have just arrived here and you know, they, they don't know each other. They don't know you. They don't care about the local place. And so, the community is just gone. I used to be able to walk through the town, the, the main street in my town, and at least see a couple of people that I knew on any given day. You know, I, I walk past a couple of pubs and, you know, all right, mate, I then, you know, bump into family members. It's all, it's all gone. It's all changed. And this is the problem with mass immigration, especially at the rate that it's happening in my country. Is it just, it's, it's a slow motion sort of, it's the colonization of the global order. These are the global nomads who have just come for the money. You know, they're just here for mercenary reasons because there, there are lots of people who do come to Britain and come to England in particular because they like the place. And those people would actually be welcome. It's just that they're lost in this tidal wave of people yeah. who are there with their hands out going, okay, Gibbs, 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 Gibbs. It's like, well, why do we allow a single one of those people in? You know, let's, I'm happy for the people who like this country to come here, but the people who just want our money, <laughs> piss off, son, you know? And I'm guessing there's almost no one in Parliament who is even interested in touching this issue, correct? Well, this has happened under the last 12 years of the Conservative government. Yeah. You know, it yeah. began under the, the Tony Blair government. It's happening. And it, it, Tony Blair, the most he let in in one given year, I think was something like 500,000. It was under Boris that it hit a million. And so it's like, right, 
These parties are not interested in dealing with the, the word immigration. They won't touch it because they, of course, they could stop it at any time because all it right. is is people saying, I'd like to apply for a visa to the United Kingdom. We can have a little sign that says, sorry, we're not accepting applications at this time. That's it. That's yeah, all you'd yeah. have to do. And for some reason, they won't do it. So the answer, the, the question is, okay, why won't they do it? Um, and it seems that they think it's the path to economic growth. If we just bring in all these mercenaries, then that will be good for the, econ the economy of the United Kingdom. It's like, okay, well, that will be good right up until there's a, cr a crash. And then all these people just fuck off because they've got no ties to the place. And therefore your economy will crash even harder than you were expecting. And so this is a total fantasy that this is going to work out in the long term. Wow. Okay. Well. That's a so yeah, it's it's pretty 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 black pilling, and it, and these in the meantime we've got to live with the consequences of feeling alienated in our own houses. Like, I haven't moved anywhere, you know. I didn't right. go to the Maghreb. I didn't go to Baghdad. I didn't go to India. You know, no. This has all come to us, and so and I I, I, I saw a friend of mine in town a couple of months ago. I was like, all right, John, how you doing? And he said, mate, I don't know where the fuck I am, and he's lived in this town his whole life. You know, he's never lived anywhere else, and it's just like. This is being done to people. It's like the washing out of their culture through mass immigration. And, and it's a and genuinely a, cruel thing. And does the media simultaneously claim that this isn't really happening, but also that it's the best thing ever? Yeah. Well, no, they're actually, no, they, they're generally just quite silent on it because everyone okay. can see this happening. And so you can't raise the subject. Oh, you're, oh, I knew you were a racist. Okay, fine. You know, whatever you have to call me but it's still happening. And so no one can talk about it. No one wants to talk about it. And it's destroying everything as well. That's the thing. But right? Here's the other thing, Carl. If you had a huge, like 40% of a town was German now and people just only spoke German, they're white. I don't think anyone, you'd be like, hooray, you know, bring, bring over more Germans. Well, this is exactly the point that I, I've made many, many times. Like lots of these people are European. For example, right, in London, the BBC did a, a sort of like mini doc uh, the other day where they were saying, oh, look at this, in the east end of London, there are 200,000 French people. It's like, oh, aren't there meant to be 200,000 Cockneys living there, actually? Yeah. Because it turns out all the Cockneys are kind of fled to Essex and the surrounding area now. And as an indigenous ethnic group, the Cockneys are being erased. They're being just dissipated into the wider English culture because they can't live in London anymore. There's no Cockneys left in London virtually. And they actually did a, a little series called The Last Whites of the East End, why white? There are loads of whites in the East End. They're just all sp French and German speaking. You know, it's the last English in the East End, the last Cockneys in the East End. And these these people are just basically, well, I'm just not leaving. I just don't care. I'm, you know, I'm just not doing it. It's like, well, good for you guys, but, you know, it's not looking good. Um, but yeah, you are right. Like, if, if <laughs> London, London filled with Germans. Oh, brilliant. I'm so thrilled. Thank yeah. God they share a skin color with me. Oh, my concerns are over. No, fuck off the lot of you. <laughs> Carl, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Uh, uh, probably the beginning, actually. I, 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 was, I was having a very good time before I had to talk about the dire state of my bloody country. You are welcome. <laughs>